worthy of God. He says, social researchers have repeatedly found that fatherless children are more likely to, and it, it lists a bunch of things that are probably true, but just all the, the things in society. He says, the most impactful solution to societal problems is not at the state house, it's at the home. Yeah. Fathers can change the world by changing the home. Fathers who live in the home become more active in their children's lives than those who do not live at home. The U.S. has the highest rate of fatherless children in the world, a statistic that has tripled in the same time frame as the rise above the social problems of the, of the above social problems in the past 50 years. If fatherlessness is a major problem, then that would mean God was right all along when he gave to fathers the responsibility to raise their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, which yeah. is Ephesians 6, 4. It's, it's very timely that you said that, not just because it's Father's Day, but one of the things I've been trying to, to teach lately in all of the lessons, and we'll see it today too, is the, go ahead and turn over to Romans 5, is the issue of the doctrine is just not something we learn so that we understand it and can talk about it in these rooms or debate it on Facebook, <laughs> that's my issue, or, or things like that. The issue is to put the doctrine of God on display to, as it says over in, in Titus, to adorn the doctrine of God. Fathers have a responsibility to bring up their children in the admonition, respect and admonition of the Lord that's right. for just that very reason. <clears throat> that's where you take the, 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 the doctrine and, and put it into display. Put it on again. The issue is not just that we know the doctrine. The issue is so the doctrine lives out of us. Um, we'll just leave it at that. Just leave it at that. Okay, turn over to Romans 5. So happy Father's Day to all the fathers. Yeah. Happy Father's Day to you too. Thanks. Question always is, are you a good father because you got good kids, or you have good kids because you're a good father? I'm gonna have to come down on the side. Well, I'm a good father because I got good kids. <laughs> if I had bad kids, I'd be a bad father. <laughs> My kids made it easy. Don't tell them I said that. <laughs> Chapter five of the Book of Romans, verse one. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So we've been working through this. Obviously, we've seen that uh, let me see here. tribulation works patience. Patience works experience. Experience works hope. We're going to look at today. And then hope, if we have time, we'll look at the issue of Makes us not ashamed, and how that how that works out. We've seen tribulation. You know, he after he says talks about tribulation, he he says knowing. We glory in tribulations also knowing, and he doesn't go on to say, okay, and we know that God's mad at us. We know that God's punishing us. We know that God's testing our faith, that He's trying our faith, that He's seeing how strong of a Christian you are. He says no. Tribulation, just after he tells us we're saved by grace, he said, okay, now that we glory in tribulation also, because that tribulation works what? Patience. And we looked mm -hmm. at that issue, right? What was the issue with patience? It's just not waiting. It's resting in the Lord. Right. Letting the word of God work out in you. Taking that, that intake, that doctrinal intake, resting in the Lord. And then last week, we looked at that, that issue of experience. And do you remember what we talked about with experience? And the, 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 the phrase that really sticks out to me when we talk about experience is that issue over in Hebrews, right? Of, through having your senses exercised to discern good and evil. Mm -hmm. When you go through tribulation under a doctrinal understanding, you let that doctrine live out of you, you approach those things, you, you approach the tribulations in your life, does that make any better? Mm -hmm. From a doctrinal standpoint, you get experience, you get your senses exercised. Okay, this is what's going on, this is what the Bible tells me I should do about it, and you either do it or you don't do what the Bible applies, right? Your senses are exercised, you're exercised, you're doing something, you're making a decision. 
based on the doctrine. You're either using the doctrine and going through it, or you're ignoring the doctrine yep. and going through it. And it doesn't mean you're a terrible person if you ignore the doctrine, because I know somebody that ignores the doctrine all the time. <laughs> I don't mean to, but the flesh jumps up, doesn't it? Yeah. I've got a better way. I know the verse says, but if I do it like this, but when we go through it with the doctrine, we build some experience. Those senses are exercised to know, and I'm just going to put down good, because the point of going through the tribulation patiently resting in God is so that our senses are exercised to understand the good, to, to realize, okay, look, at, when, I, when we go through it, and the, we let the doctrine live out of us. We go through it the way God prescribed it, we should go through a situation. Our hearts and minds are kept. The next time that we go through a situation or tribulation, we say, you know, the last time the doctrine worked out for me, let me go ahead and try it again. You know what we call that? Hope. Because I have hope that the next time I go through tribulation, if I'm in a glory in tribulation, it's going to help to have some kind of hope at the end of that, glory, or that tribulation, isn't it? Yep. Countries go to war. That terrible, terrible thing that war is. Don't they expect at the end there's some kind of a hope? There's some kind of a payoff? A peace, right. When we go through tribulation, we want to be, need to be able to look at, find some hope. Now the hope isn't always going to be what the world tells you it should be, or even your flesh tells you it's going to be. It's going to be earnest The hope is that you're going to be able to succeed as you go through this in a doctrinal proper manner as you go through that tribulation you know um, I've had a rule for <laughs> as long as I've had Facebook I've had a rule, no politics <laughs> I broke that rule and I have not been able to unbreak that rule, un unbreak the breaking of the rule and I need to get back to that because you know what I'm going through tribulation and I'm all worked up when I stay away from it and go, you start looking at things from a doctrinal standpoint, I get some calm and I get some peace and I get some hope and I yeah. begin to get, instead of wrapped up in what's going on here in the world today, I go, you know what, the world's not going to get any better. Nope. The things that I'm all worked up about today, even if they were solved according to how King Dave wants, <laughs> tomorrow there's going to be another set of problems that's going to get me just as upset. Different names, same problem, you know what, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. Until until the Lord raptures us out of here, we're going to be in the presence of sin. Until the Lord comes back at His second coming and sets up, sets up His kingdom, the world's never going to operate as it should. No matter how upset I get, no matter how many posts I put on Facebook, that those facts don't change. If I ran the world. <laughs> Good thing I'm not God, because you know what? I'd be imputing sin. And that's the flesh, isn't it? I'd be yeah. zapping. That shows me the awesomeness of a God, though. That in all this, in this time here, and all that's going on, he's not imputing sin to the world. Yep. It's time of grace and peace. And all the turmoil that's in the world, whatever you want, whatever issue you want it to be. And you know, there are things going on in other parts of the world that we're not aware of that are just as upsetting to those people. Think about that. Yeah. So Dave, that first step is so what you're saying in regard to patience. Maybe the, for us, kind of like the first step would be rest and then kind of build that doctrine more. So. Rest, rest in the Lord and what the doctrine says. Yeah. Now, when we say rest, we say patiently wait on the Lord. We want to be careful. We don't use that as an excuse to procrastinate. It's easy to, it really is easy to find out what God has prescribed for us in any given situation. He wrote it down. Now, to, 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 for it to become in you and, and get the doctrine built up, it takes, it takes study. But yes, ultimately that is what I'm saying. When the tribulation comes, when that, that, that patience is to get in the Word of God, find out what does the Word of God say about this situation in my life, and then go make a decision. Okay, I'm going to do what the doctrine says, or I'm not. Well, and is. don't mistake, it is a decision yeah. that we all make. Wasn't Satan making me do it? Wasn't that flesh jump? I mean, it is a flesh, but it's not the flesh jump when I'm going to get me. It's, 
I'm doing it. Look over at James real quick. Well, where I think in, uh, James one. James. What were you saying? Where I think patience is important is if you understand emotions are reactors. They're just reactionary, and so if you were to make a decision when you're in your emotional state, it's not going to be a very good decision. So right. when you're patient, and you wait on the Lord. Right? It's not procrastinating. But I know when when I when I rest in the, the Lord and when I can get quiet in a situation, verses come to my mind. That's right. Things that wouldn't verses that come to my mind that wouldn't come if I was being in an emotional state. Question: Are emotions smart or dumb? They're dumb. They're dumb. Are they good or bad? Well, they can be. They're good, good right? God gave you emotions. God gave you the emotions, but we so often follow our emotions. <laughs> maybe, yeah, you know, I look. Maybe there is, a, there, is, there is, a, there are natural differences there. But I mean, I know, I know. <laughs> She's married to a guy that's an emotional wreck from time to time. All right, there in, in our house, I am I'm much truthfully said, I am much more high strung, and I can go from here to there and back up there in about twenty seconds. And there's three ladies here that will tell you, in our house, the emotional wreck is not a woman; it's a man. <laughs> <laughs> there's no, I mean, there's no argument about that one. <laughs> well, just living with women. <laughs> James 1, verse 14. Now, tribulation doesn't necessarily have to be a, a, a temptation. It could just be, I got COVID in the world. I, got, I can't go downtown because of the riot. Whatever the, that, whatever that, but the, the issue of understanding that we make a decision. Look at verse 14. Every man is tempted when he was drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Yep. You make a decision to do something. Now, being saved we have a huge advantage over the rest of the world, over those people that are not saved. We have access yeah. to the Word of God that will effectually work in us if we believe. Yeah. An unsaved person, they have access to the Word of God, but it will not work in them. Because two, two reasons. They don't believe they're not saved. And two, they don't believe it. It might be a good self-help book. It might have some really good things to say. I had somebody tell me today... I, this week, I don't understand why people do this. People that reject the Bible want to go up against somebody that teaches the Bible. Not that I'm anybody great, but they want to and, and, and make some statements that are so ridiculous. The, the statement made to me was, Jesus would be at the protests. And of course, any of you that have been around me any, any length of time know exactly what my response was. What? Show me the verse. You know, show me the money, show me the verse. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Somebody that doesn't believe this thing, the, the, the Word of God, I don't mean to be afraid of it, doesn't really believe the Bible, can read it and come up with all kinds of crazy conclusions. But there's no doctrinal truth to that. There's no, it's not in their heart. We have the advantage that we have the Word of God that works effectually in us. We have the Holy Spirit in us. Yeah. We have the Lord Jesus Christ in us. We have access to the Father with boldness at any moment that we want it. And we can come by and say, this hurts. And I know your word says that, but I don't like it. Help me. That's high ground. We've had fun with it, but it was a true story. The story I told you when I got the guy with the and I, I the verse says to forgive, and I spent literally three days looking for a loophole, couldn't find it. But you know, I think also, we go fast, you know. We go. Fast. I know the verse says, but I and I think I want to try it a little bit to get away from Lord help me, but believe that Christ liveth in me, and right that. He, he, if I get out of the way, he'll do it for me. Now, I haven't quite got all that, but I really do believe that's the answer. That okay. Look over at Philippians 2. This is great because this is a discussion that really lays the groundwork for, for the lesson that's today. We'll probably do part of next week. And what's so important, and as I, I, as I look out in the world today, and I, and I see, man, we, it's it's time for the doctor not to be stopped talking about, but it's for the, it's 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 for the walk to be seen. Mm -hmm. 
I have friends all over, you know, Facebook friends, not my real friends, but Facebook friends all over the world that claim to be race, uh, uh, right dividers and grace people. There are, you can understand right division and have no clue about grace. Grace is, a, grace is an attitude. Grace is the way you live. Grace is not a word. Grace is the way a Christian should live, a saved person should live, understanding who they are in Christ. So back to what you said. Look at Philippians 2. Verse 12. Look at Philippians 2, verse 12. He says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Paul goes, and you've done well when I'm there. When I'm not there, you still need to obey. You still need to do what you're supposed to do. Work out your salvation. Now, the salvation is not soul salvation. It's deliverance from the fighting and, and strife and whatnot that was going on in the Philippian church. And he tells them, guys, work it out. You can do it. Now, why can they do it? Look at the very next verse. For it is God which worketh in you, yep. both to will and and to do of his good pleasure. He tells the Philippians, look, you guys got some problems there. When I'm there, you're fine. When I'm not there, though, you need to continue to fund the doctrine. I'm not mad at you. I can hear my emotions kind of mad. <laughs> he says, and you can do it because it's God working in you. He told them earlier in the book that God works in them, is going to stay working in them until the uh, rapture, both to will. He's going to change their thinking so that they, God will work in you to change your thinking. And then he'll also motivate you to go out and do it, right? It's one thing to change your thinking. But if you're not motivated to act on that change of thinking, right? When I say that, when I make that comment, it's just not enough to know the doctrine. You've got to be able to adorn the doctrine, put the doctrine on display. That's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Change your will. It's God that's working in you to change your will and to get you to do what you want, that you, what you're supposed to do. It's a decision that we make. So yeah, you, Tammy, you're right. It, it is. But ultimately, it does come down to that issue of, of, of crying, Abba, Father. Hey, look, he knows the issue is bigger than you. How do you know that the issue is bigger than you? Oh, yeah. right there. If the issue wasn't bigger than you, then Jesus wouldn't have had to die on the cross. You could have handled it. The wages of sin is death. death. When you were without, we'll see this verse in a couple weeks. When you were without strength, he died for the ungodly. When you couldn't do anything about your predicament, he died for you. So it's, when you come to God and say, hey, this is in my life and it hurts and it's real and I'm confused and I don't know what to do. I can't see tomorrow. I need some verses. I need help believing the verse. And I understand we all believe the verse, but I'm applying the verses. Mm -hmm. Help me to understand what does the mind of Christ look like in this situation? And you know, it might be different for me than it is for you. And we both could be in the will of God. In our Acts study, we're going to see Paul says, I wanted Apollos to do this, and Apollos didn't want to. That's interesting, isn't it? Both men of God. We're all at different, different spiritual minded. walks. Right. We run into different people. We run into different people, different circumstances. You guys have heard me give this example. Tanya, you roll your eyes probably when I say it. I've been married 30 years to my lovely bride here. My daughter's been married three years. Three years to her husband, who, by the way, didn't show up for church today, but we're not making a note of that. <laughs> uh, circumstances might come up in life where they may, April and I might make a decision about something based on 30 years of life experience and study of the Word of God, they might make, a, an ex, in the same similar circumstance, a completely different situation based on three years of marriage yeah. and study of the Word of God, and they both can be completely in the, word, in, in the will of God and both be different decisions. There's a verse I was going to look at later today. I don't know if we'll get to it now, but helper of your joy, not have dominion over your faith. It's different for, for in every situation. But the will of God doesn't change. The verse isn't different. Right. The verse is the same. How you apply it as a mature saint, that's why we go. This is, one of, this is the first thing he tells that Paul tells the same person. This is the this is the path to maturity. 
Tribulation comes in your life. You, you go through it with doctrinally. Your senses are exercised so you can approve what's good and evil. Hey, that was a good decision. That was a bad decision. That was an evil decision. It works out some hope. Hey, tribulation, I understand now. It works out in me. That's how I mature. I don't know if I'm ever going to get to where I glory in tribulation, but I can understand what it is. That makes me not ashamed. So often we have tribulation, we don't want people to know we're ashamed. Maybe we're ashamed because we haven't studied the Word of God like we're supposed to. Mm -hmm. But we work through these things. We go through tribulation in a godly, godly manner with doctrinal understanding and we mature. And your shame comes from trying to do it yourself and you can't. But there's no shame in having to rely on God and having God do the work in you. That's right. There's shame in understanding that the answer's in this book. Putting that book down, going through something, and it doesn't work out. That would be kind of shameful. You got the answer. Don't even look at the answer. So that's a very good point. Where were we? <laughs> All right. So uh, the issue, yeah, we're, today I want to talk about about hope. Now, there's one more thing I want to look at with tribulation that I want to bring out here. If you would come over to Second Peter two, and this is a doctrinal issue or a dispensational issue. There are three reasons you suffer in life. You live in a sin cursed world. We make bad decisions, and there's a specific one that the believers have uh, of persecutions for Christ, right? That we that we yeah. we take. It's like when April and I go to Arizona and uh, to Phoenix and Southern California in the cold months here. That's, we're suffering for Christ when we go down there to teach. <laughs> but there are real sufferings that we get. Right? We're ostracized. We lose friends. We stand for the word of God rightly divided. People don't want anything to do with that. And that that's a real, those are real sufferings. Well, it's because we're no longer part of this world. Right. But look what Peter says here in, in chapter 2 and verse 19. Now again, Peter's talking. To this group out here. I'm in the wrong book. There we go. Look at verse 19. First Peter 2, 19. For this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience sake toward God endure grief, suffering wrongly. So he, what he's saying is thankworthy. If, if you're suffering for Christ, right, conscious toward God, that's thankworthy. 20. For what glory is it if, when we be buffeted by our, for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if, when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. Peter's laying out, there's two types of sufferings there. There's a suffering for God, and this is a regular suffering. Yeah. And he's making a difference there. It's very thankworthy if you go through... That suffering for Christ. There's some glory there. Right? The other one, God still uh, is, is approving of. But you see, Paul makes a difference between the two types of suffering there. Mm -hmm. Paul doesn't make that difference in Romans 5. Paul's talking about the tribulation in your life, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And that's a dispensational change that Paul brings out here. No matter what the tribulation in your life is, there's a way to go through it properly. And it works in your behalf. There is a teaching out there, and it's in grace service, that the only suffering that matters is a specific, very specific suffering for Christ. Anything else is just gain. And that's not true. And that's not what Romans 5 tells us. Romans tells us 5 is that we glory in tribulation because we know that. So we're very careful that we understand when we this dispensational setting here that Paul's talking about versus what Peter's talking about is all tribulation then put it higher there is a special suffering for Christ of course but Paul's telling you no matter what comes into your life you're floating in the deep you know it, whatever it is in your life that's causing you tribulation this is how you need to go through it now the flip side of that too is that means if you're suffering for something in the secular world, if I can put it that way, and not related to your Christian walk, this is still the answer. Mm -hmm. 
This is the answer with your coworkers, with your spouse, with your children, with the stranger on the road, with the events of the world, with your government. Talking to myself now. That's the way in all of the tribulation. An important distinction we need to understand. Uh, look over at 2 Thessalonians. Uh, look at 2 Timothy 4. Do you just kind of say, my hope is in Christ, my hope is not in earthly things, or, or you know, um, the stability of our government, or whatever? Uh, this thing's upside down, I guess. I, I have an answer. Um, you can, if, if let, me, let me do it at the end, because, uh, well, let me just do it now. We're gonna we're gonna get to it anyhow. There's some there's an event that's gonna happen this week that's very interesting. So I'm gonna erase this. I can put this back up. It's a real world example that I've been working through myself about doctrine. There's something in, there's and you guys all know what it is when I get to it. There's something going on that I just can't stand. I just can't stand. And I spent a lot of time on this about some of the verses. And I've had to work myself through and understand those verses say what those verses say. And now I'm just going to rest on them. And it bugs me. But that's what the, that's what the verses say. So let me, let me just go through this. Let me go through, let me, we'll go come to that. Let me do 2 Timothy 4 because I want to finish that real quick. Well, I took it down. This is just a real world example we're going to look at here of Paul and his experience. I wanted to get to that, and then we're going to get to hope. Let me get to this, and we'll get to the, what Tammy was talking about. Then we'll look at backwards. 2 Timothy 4, verse 16. An example of what Paul did. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened with me, strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay. When he first his first answer, nobody stood with him. Everybody forsook him. Mm-hmm. That's tribulation. Oh, yeah. How, is it, would that not bring shame? I mean, just think yeah. about in the real world. When you, if you stood up and you made your defense, you made your point, you made your case, how many of you have done it? Hey, I got some friends and family here. Let me tell you about right division. I am so excited about this, and I know you will be too. And you share it, and they go, "What? You're in a cult. You're a blasphemer." And Paul's talking about higher level stuff than that. He says, you know what? But when I went through it, I knew that God stood with me. I didn't, man didn't stand with me. No man stood with me. But God stood with me. Mm -hmm. He rested in that. And then that last verse, he comes to understand that there's the hope. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work. Hey, at the first nobody stood with me, only the Lord did. I went through it properly. I went through it. I relied on the Lord. And he delivered me out of the mouth of the lion. A lot of different discussions about what that is. He understood the delivery. He relied on the Lord. He got delivered. Tribulation is working his patience. His patience is experience. He's become into an experience. And the last verse, and the Lord will deliver me. He Now he knows looking forward that he's going to get delivered because he saw what God did in the past. It's hope. What Paul's doing in this verse is he's just putting Romans 5 on display. Take the doctrine, and here's the practical application of Paul's life. Paul didn't teach things that he didn't go through and understand himself. 
That was supposed to be the end of the experience, which was last week. I didn't get to it. But I want you to see yeah. that the Bible is just not a book with a bunch of words in it. Here's the doctrine. Here's the application. Paul does it time and time and time again. When we get to Romans 7, we'll see that big time when he goes into his own life. Back to your question. How does the doctrine... Well, yeah, go for it, my friend. I'm sorry to interrupt. But yeah. When people out in the group start asking you questions, I can't hear what they're oh. saying. And so when you start answering... I you don't know the question. Because I don't know what you're talking about. Gotcha. The question... Okay, so the question is going to be... That I'm going to look at right now, the question that came up is... And if I got it right... is. How, how do you do that? When, when something's in your life, and the example was of getting all caught up in the politics of the world, go look at my Facebook page, you'll see how caught up I am in it. How do you let that doctrine calm you down? How do you let that doctrine work out in your life? Yeah, think about it. And there's something that's just coming down in just a couple of days that I've had to think about because it bugs me, and it bugs me a lot. But let, so let's go through it. Look over with me if you would. 2 Corinthians 1. We're just going to put a couple of verses together. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 24. Some of you may be familiar with this verse. It's the Berean Bible Ministries down in Southern California's theme verse. And it says, what does it say? Not for that we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy, for by faith ye stand. So as we go through this, because Bill, this is where Bill O'Link's going to say, Dave, you're meddling. <laughs> so I'm going to meddle. And people aren't going to like it. And I know that. I don't like it. You understand, as a Bible teacher, I've told you guys this many, it's not my job to tell you how to live your life. That's your job. It is my job to show you how to get the profit out of this book that God put in it so that in the circumstances of your life, you can make a decision. And the decision you make might be different than the decision I make, and it might both be perfectly in the will of God. My job is to help you be a helper of your joy. So as we go through this, I don't want you to think, anybody think when we get down to the end that I'm going to be mad if you make a different decision than I do, because I'm not. I'm never going to bring it up again. I'm not even going to look at you funny. I won't even complain to her in the car. Of course, we take two cars now. so. <laughs> but I want you to understand, I take this as a Bible teacher, I take this very seriously. It doesn't stop me from telling you, hey, this is how I understand the verse, and we need to put that doctrine on display. But you need to understand, I do not have dominion over your faith. And you need to understand that I understand that. But I also will, I'm not afraid, not scared to show you what the verses say. So come with me to Romans 13. Romans 13, verse 1. You guys need to come along with Greg. I will tell you this. And stop me when a question gets asked. And tell me to repeat it. Because this came up the other day somewhere. At the truck stop, didn't it? Yeah. Glenn said, the same, Glenn said exactly the same thing. And I told him. Glenn, I talked to John and Richard and everybody I ever teach with, we all, we all have the same complaint against us that we don't repeat the question. And we always say, okay, I will do it. And we never do. <laughs> Please don't hesitate to say, what was the question? Because I know how frustrating that can be. The Okay, I'm going to get sidetracked. The worst is I listen to John in the car, right? But John doesn't finish verses. <laughs> because he's in a live setting and he wants the crowd to finish a verse. And he'll say... He'll read half the verse, and he'll say, and then what's the rest of the verse say? And I'm driving down, John, I don't know. <laughs> could you finish it, please? So I tell John this one time. John, you know, if you could not do that, it'd be great. He says, okay. So I hear him a couple of weeks later, right? And he's, he's telling this story. He says, yeah, I talked to David. David liked me to finish a verse. So I'm like, this is great. And he still doesn't do it. 
<laughs> so please don't hesitate to say, hey, what was the question? Okay. I don't have dominion over your faith. Verse 13, chapter 13, verse 1. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. He's talking about positions of government. He's not talking about the people in the government. He's talking about the positions. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that risk, resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and that shalt help praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. This is a touchy subject. There are people who will take these verses and say, our founding fathers never should have left England. Now, I don't describe to that at all. And I don't describe to the fact that you blindly obey your leaders, especially in the country that we live in. We have several mechanisms to re redress. We can vote. We can appeal. We can vote people in and out. We can protest. Now, there's a way to do it and a way not to do it. But there is an issue of what he's saying about the governmental authority in whatever land and don't forget the time Paul lived when he wrote that. As bad as we think our government is You're sometimes, and the abuses, yeah. it doesn't compare. Yeah. And I don't mean to minimize what goes on in our country, or any country for that matter. But Rome was not a nice country, yeah. you know. So he, he understand what, what Paul's saying. They didn't go, you know, they didn't get to go and vote every two years. They didn't have recall petitions so that they could get people out of office, things like that. So understand there's a perspective here. If the, if the leader, if the government is telling you to do something that's against the word of God, you shouldn't, you shouldn't go against the word of God. You understand that? So there's perspective on this. Okay. Come with me over to Philippians 2, where we just were. Someone's at the door. Philippians 2, verse 1. This is an issue where people were fighting in Philippians. They wanted the, the, the glory. They wanted things. But I just want you to get where he tells you your attitude towards your fellow neighbor should be. Here it's, it's the church. to another member of the assembly, but I think you get my point. Verse 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, are there those things? Mm -hmm. There certainly are. Yeah. Right? Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one cord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, is what I want you to catch, let, every, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. I was reading this verse. And this is where we're going to come to it. This is the, this is the, this is the, this is the payout that nobody in this room is going to like. I was reading this verse at the house the other day. I think Jocelyn was there. I know April was. I said, ladies, I found the verse for masks. And that's it. Why do we wear, well, you know, we have to wear a mask. And outside, we leave our home. We have to wear a mask on June 24th in the Tri-County area. Philippians 2, 1 through 4. Philippians 2, 1 through 4. Why do they tell us we're supposed to wear a mask? For the safety of others. Esteeming others better than ourselves. Think every man. I'm... Yeah. I don't like that. I don't like that. I wear that thing at Home Depot eight hours a day or however long I'm at Home Depot. And at the end of the day, I am ready to throw that thing away. I had the thing on for 20 minutes this morning and I'm soaking wet and I'm hot and it's miserable and it's... That's... There's, there's the doctrine. And you may come to a different decision than I do and I, I'm not mad at you, not in the, any of that. Walk through that door next time you don't have a mask on, I'm fine. It's, I'm, 
find that not going to be an issue. But that's how you let the doctrine work out in you. Now you got to make a decision. Now you're all mad at me. Don't need to point the works out there. <laughs> <laughs> now i got to deal with that. <laughs> but that's what we think. And that's a real world thing that we all have to come to grips with in 48 hours. And I'm going to stand here and tell you, man, the mess are miserable. Yeah. But obey your leaders and esteem others more than yourself. The one, yeah, the one that really gets me is the esteeming others. Yeah, because it may protect someone who's mm -hmm. vulnerable. So that's just a real, we talk about it all the time, and it's real easy to talk about it on Sunday morning and, you know, kind of get back and talk about doctrine and think, yeah, you know, we got it all figured out. We do, though. That's a real world example. Just like when we get into that fight with that person at work, or the club we're in, or the church we belong to, and we don't like it, and that verse says, forgive others. Well, but you don't understand. <laughs> yeah, the Bible understands. You notice, too, those verses didn't say anything about the other person. This is Paul talking to the Corinthians carnal Christians, babes that were not maturing, 10,000 instructors. And he said, I am not to have dominion over your faith. I'm going to be a helper of your joy. And that's grace right that's there. That's doctrine, right. Yeah. This is a doctrine that we need to think about as well. When we come in, not just as a teacher up here standing behind a podium, but as we come to deal with people in our lives. You know, I got a guy, uh, you know, I... People at Home Depot are starting to find out I'm a pastor, and a lot of them don't think that's very neat. A lot of them, of course, they have a positive opinion of it, and we talk about it and stuff. But, you know, I, I, I don't force, you know. And one guy says, you know, my pastor, he can even make that boring old King James Bible come alive. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, I, I don't sit down and say, you know, you need the King James Bible, and if you don't, you're going to hell. You know what I hear? At least you're hearing the King James Bible once a week. You may not like it, but wherever you're going to church, your pastor's preaching, and he can make that old thing come alive, so you're listening. Help her of your joy. God made it come alive. But, yeah. Right. But, you know, I mean, th there's two ways to deal with some, to a, with a situation like that. You know? If you got somebody that says, you know, I like the NIV and not the King James. You guys all know I'm where I'm nice stand on this. Is that if the Word of God, the perfectly preserved Word of God in the English language is found in the King James Bible today, period. Yeah. But if somebody came to me with an NIV Bible and said, can you show me how to get saved? I'd figure it out. Helper of your joy, yeah. not dominion over your faith. Esteem others better than yourselves. You know, I got one guy who, who um, when I told him, I said, look, I understand your struggles. You've reached out to me. I pastor a church. If you want to see the verses, you come find me. I'm not going to chase you around in this store. I've got the verses. I can give you some comfort on it. I'm not, I don't even know if the person's saved, and that's where we're going to start. I do not have dominion over even that person's faith. I am to be a helper of that person's joy. See, the doctrine, study what, understand what the doctrine says, and understand, this is important too, understand the doctrine says it to you. It doesn't say, the verse doesn't say, I'm not to have dominion over your faith as long as you agree with me. It doesn't say, I'm not to have dominion over your faith if you don't rightly, unless you don't rightly divide. See, there's no caveat here. There's no unless. And what's interesting, too, is Paul has said he's an apostle to the Corinthians. He has told them to follow him. Think about some of the things that Paul has said to the Corinthians. And then he starts the second verse, the second chapter, the second book, telling them, I'm not to have dominion over your faith, but I'm to be a helper of your joy. We are not to have dominion over one another's faith, but to be helpers of each other's joy. That means when you find a brother or sister in a fault, you come to them with, with some scripture, but you don't pound on them. I 
That's how the doctrine lives out in you. Look over at Titus 2.10. I'll say this too, you can't, you, you can't let the doctrine get in you and live out of you if you don't study the doctrine. Right. Study to show thyself approved a what? Workman. Workman that needeth not be ashamed. I don't have it written up here. What's the last thing we're going to look at over in Romans 5? Shame. Hope maketh not ashamed. Not ashamed. See, there's a correlation there. Yeah. Correlation from not being ashamed to the, to learn of the doctrine. Titus 2, uh, verse 1. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. And then 2 through 9, he lists those things. Look at verse 10. Not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may what? Adorn, Adorn the, doctrine. the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. By the way, there's the verse that tells you Jesus Christ is God. But the issue is adorning the doctrine of God. What do you do when you adorn something? You dress it up. You, you dress it you up, treat right? It you ladies get all adorned, right? You get your earrings on, and you get your beautiful pearls on. And I got my hair cut the other day. Nice, nice six dollar sport coat. <laughs> Put the doctrine of God on. Adorn it. Value it, yeah. Value it. Let other people see it. You gotta know it though. And you gotta know the doctrine applies to you. Don't worry about how somebody else applies the doctrine. That's not your concern. You are not to have dominion over somebody else's faith. You're to be a helper of their joy. Mm -hmm. That's a powerful verse. We read by that verse, but that'll change the way you deal with people. That'll change the way you deal with people in the secular world. You know what else that involves? Understanding where a person is. There are people at the lumber yard I work at, probably shouldn't have said the name, that know that I'm a pastor and they love to sit down and talk doctrine. And so, Depending on what time, depending on how I'm feeling, I either avoid the lunchroom or don't. Right? <laughs> but there are some people they don't want to talk about. No. So, they're given the opportunity, I share it, but I think it's they're not going to receive it anyhow. People want to talk about doctrine. We talk about some of these things. We try to steer them, steer them down the right path. But you can't. You're not going to force anybody to hear anything. And the more we try to do it, and I've been there, the more we try to do it, the more the wall comes up and the more the pushback happens. Does he make you believe the events at the cross no. saved you? Mm -mm. Does he demand, once you do believe it, that you live a perfect life? Or you'll lose it. Yeah. The very next verse in Philippians. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. And talks about his humility. Adorning the doctrine of God. So important. So important. But you got to know the doctrine. And you got to understand the doctrine is not just something for Sunday morning, Tuesday nights, Thursday nights, Wednesday Bible study, Facebook clubs. It's where you go live it. And trust me, I am talking to myself. But that's that's really I don't know how we got here today, but it was well worth it. It is actually this is the wrap up of what the lesson was going to be about hope. But we need to be out there understanding the doctrine and then go live. Am I telling you, don't, you know, to just lay down and do everything the government tells you? I am not telling you that. I'm telling you the way to do it, though, is an adoptional, it, it, is, there's a proper doctrinal way to do it. Now, 
that also applies when you're, you know, maybe maybe that's not your concern. Maybe, you know, all this stuff that's going on in the world, you got bigger things in your own personal life to deal with. And I, I get that too. But the same attitude, the same issues need to apply to those things. Raising family, dealing with coworkers, dealing with the person that gives you a snarky look because you don't have your mask on. Don't have a mask on. I won't call you that. You know. How do you how do you respond? Do you look at people that make a different decision than you in a less than positive light? Now I'm not talking evil stuff. I'm talking it's read the verses, understand, come to a conclusion on what the doctor means, and then make a deci different decision about you, about, about than you do about the situation. Doesn't mean they're bad people. Like I said, you have to make a decision based on doctrinal maturity in your own self in the circumstances of your life. Because everybody's life is different. Everybody's right. in a different spot. Well, we're talking about adorning the doctrine of God. If you're going to adorn it, can you put on earrings and hair gel if you don't have the earrings and the hair gel? No. Can you adorn the doctrine of God if you don't have the doctrine of God, don't know the doctrine of God? You can't. You got to get in and study it. You got to get in and study it. Adorning is like displaying it. Put it on display. That's right. Make it shine. When you want to adorn something, do you take it out dirty? You take it out clean. You want everybody to see the value of it, don't you? Do you have anything more valuable in your life than the doctrine of the grace of God to go put on display? No. No matter where you are, at the lumber yard, at church, at the protest, if you're at the protest. You know, people have different emotions, different experiences, different things that bring them to wherever they are in life. The doctrine doesn't change. The doctrine is what the doctrine is. Forgive others, esteem others better than yourselves, rightly divide the word of truth. I can list that board for days, right? With the doctrines that we teach and need to apply, need to apply. But we need to make sure that we're doing that and get ourselves out of the way, get our yeah buts out of the way. Isn't that what we do? Yeah, but I know we're supposed to wear a mask, but 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 they're uncomfortable. <laughs> Trust me, I know. <laughs> I am not looking forward to what happens. Because, see, I don't wear it. I, the only place I wear it is at Home Depot. Or if I go into a store and they say mask required, like a couple body shops. I don't wear it the rest of the place, right? I have to on Monday. If somebody comes out of their house, when I'm looking at their car, if they come out and they have a mask on, I go back to the car and put the mask on just for whatever. And, you know, they're probably not going to enforce it, but still. Is esteeming others better than yourself? Again, I, anyway, if, if you guys could come say, you know what, if you are nuts on this mask thing, I don't, I'm not wearing them. I, that's fine. I, don't, I really don't care. Mm -hmm. I'm just, here's an example. You guys make a decision. I'm not going to be mad at you. I'm not going to look funny at you. Uh, you know, you probably look funny at me. I've got several masks on order because I want to adorn the mask, apparently. <laughs> but seriously, rightly divide the word of truth. Study the doctrine. If you don't know what the doctrine is in the situation in which you find yourself, get in the book. It's in there. Find it and then make a decision. Either I'm going to follow the doctrine or I'm not. God doesn't make you follow the doctrine. He tells you what it is. says, be a follower of me. I beseech you now. And then go do that. That's how you get transformed. And don't conform to this world. Right. It's through the study and the doctrine making some decisions, and then going and living accordingly. And I say, there's, what, six, seven hundred people in this room? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Ten of us may present, be presented with the same situation, and we may come with ten different answers. All of which could possibly be in the will of God. See, the will of God is not something we go find. The will of God is consistent in your life. What you do do it with the mind of Christ. Don't 
take dominion over somebody else's faith. Be a helper of their joy. Dear Heavenly Father, we time together to study your word, study the doctrine. My prayer for all of us, beginning with myself, is to let that doctrine get into us, change our hearts, make that decision to follow the doctrine, and then adorn the doctrine. Get ourselves out of the way. Get our yeah buts out of the way. Get our, you don't understand. My life is different than what that verse means. Put those things aside. Let your word be true and every man a liar. As we come to, we go through these tribulations, these trials in the world in which we live. That we rely on your word. We are patient. We have our senses exercised to determine good and evil as we go through tribulation relying on your word and gain that experience. And that experience brings hope. And that hope makes us not ashamed. It's all based on a doctrinal understanding, getting the doctrine in us and then living, letting it live out of us. Making a decision. You've given us the doctrine. You've given us what the mind of Christ looks like. You wrote it down. 13 books, specifically two and about the church, the body of Christ and its individual members. We would get into that doctrine, understand what that doctrine means, and then believe the verse. Understand and apply it intelligently to the details of our lives. Not somebody else's life, but our life. Now take dominion over somebody else's faith, but be a helper of somebody else's joy. We do thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. And we thank you for the finished work of the cross, Lord, and all the benefits that we have being in Christ. In your name, amen.